Internet. Welcome to episode 293 of the Asota Calibers podcast, the second on the podcast. There's a little bit for everyone. I'm uh, Weird Beard. And with me tonight, she's the greatest. She's amazing. The most wonderful hostess the world has ever seen, Erin Paulette. How you doing, Erin? Uh, wow. Um, I, I did not have a good week last week, and... Uh... I, I know that by this time I promised I was going to have a press release out um, regarding us filing the the AC for the SCOTUS thing, blah blah blah. Uh, and and I just I I didn't get to it, and I feel bad. And I might have been able to do it today, but the day we're recording is April Fool's Day, and I just didn't feel right because I figure anything I post on. April 1st, people are going to look at it and think that it's a joke. So at this point, I'm just going to delay till like the second. Uh, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but it was really rough. And while I was never in danger of self-deleting, it was one of those, wow, I it's kind of a miracle I got through the, the week. So um, hopefully this week is going to be better. It, it's starting much better. And uh, I, I could use a very calm, non-eventful week. So that's more information than you wanted, I'm sure. How are you doing, Weird? I I had a similar rough rough week, and uh, I, I'm not going to even get into it. I will just say that uh, that my weekly allotment of drama has already been used up. And so, yeah, well, wait until your daughter becomes a teenager. Oh, God. I mean, it's it's happening before my eyes. and That's part of it. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, it's just yeah, my 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 daughter had a, had had a rough week. She was concerned about a number of things that were bleeding into stuff. And we had a lot of we had a lot we had a lot of irons in the fire. So she was very, very rapidly overwhelmed. My wife is getting absolutely murdered at work. So she is rapidly getting overwhelmed and tired. And we traveled up to Maine for Easter. And that was the, that we, we ended up doing a lot more stuff up there than we had originally bargained for. And uh, it, I cannot complain about the, the the lovely blessings that are my life, but uh, sometimes blessings come with drama, and uh, yeah, I I could stand to have a little less. Well, then uh, we picked a really bad week for these topics. <laughs> uh, Shall we just say good night and leave it at that? <laughs> Thanks to each and every one of our supporters on Patreon. <laughs> uh, no, nah, they're good. They're 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 good news news topics. Uh, I, most of them are, but I. Uh, all right, let's just jump into it. <laughs> all right, yeah. So 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 right off the bat, uh, uh, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin uh, vetoed a bunch of uh, gun control bills. Uh, mm hmm. And so one was an assault weapon ban. Uh, one was um, uh, is it, oh, okay. There's, there's was there was it was there a, a vampire law? Uh, Stephen Gutowski didn't go super duper deep into him, and actually was re I read another article on it, and they weren't going too deep in, into it either of what the what the suite of gun control things were going through, and uh, and there was also an expansion of the red flag law. Uh, he said overall well, they they vetoed 30 different gun control measures so yeah that's what i was going to say 30 that that's that's a lot to cover that's a lot of stuff um, really about the only thing i want to add is that i i will fess up that a lot of my predictions have not come true but i did actually predict with a fairly high level of confidence because we talked about the uh, ar15 ban i don't know how many weeks ago and i said i've got a pretty high confidence that the governor is going to veto it, and he did. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, 
Um, th- this isn't bragging. This is like, oh my god, for once I got it right. So, you know, I'm putting a win tally there. Uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting uh, about this is that he um, he actually sent some bills uh, back in order to to be further refined, and uh, and he did uh, pass into law two of them. And well, these are I, I guess I wouldn't really say toothless, but it's. Okay, one of them uh, bans devices that convert semi-automatic firearms into fully automatic ones, like Glock switches. Um, wholly superfluous, because this is already illegal at the federal level. I actually so... had an aha moment on that, though. So, <laughs> oh, so so he's he's done it a couple of times, but uh, but uh, no, 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 that's not true. Joe Biden did it once. And now uh, Mara Healy in Massachusetts uh, did it as well, which is uh, commuting uh, commuting sentences of people uh, for marijuana crimes, and uh, it, and uh, uh, for 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 Mara Healy, it is it is only misdemeanor marijuana crimes. Uh, I think I think it was actually actually it was it was actually a blanket pardon, so it was actually was removing any convictions on. But Mara Healy only did it for misdemeanors. I was going to talk about it on the show specifically uh, because oh look, this is going to actually allow people who weren't able to buy guns before because they got caught with a joint, you know, maybe even in their in their very very early adulthood, and it's going to follow them for the rest of their life. Uh, but no, it was only misdemeanor. So if, if you can't buy a gun because, because you got, you, you got pinched with a bag of weed, you still can't buy a gun because you got pinched with a bag of weed. Uh, but the point that I was saying is about, uh, Biden's, uh, pardon of federal marijuana charges is that, um, I haven't found, ev- uh, details on this, but it, it's overall considered that the number of people actually pardoned by this is extremely low because most of the people who are serving federal time for marijuana and other drug charges is for like wide scale distribution and trafficking charges, which was not included in this. And that as a general okay. rule, the people who have been punished for simple possession charges, uh, are almost exclusively charged on the state level. Uh, so oh, the what does that have to do with what I was just saying? The point that I'm saying is by uh, by Virginia passing and and all the other states passing bans on Glock switches and the like means that if they catch somebody with that, they don't have to hold them and wait for the feds to get around to trying them. They can just try and punish them for it at the state level. Oh. And the feds See, and the feds can time. get a piece of them later, but but it means that okay. it's also a, a state crime as well as a federal. Okay, so so the other one passed into law, which I also think is pretty superfluous, um, makes it illegal to give minors access to firearms if there's a reason to believe they're a threat to themselves or others. Uh, in other words, being a responsible parent and a responsible gun owner. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's overall. <laughs> I think I, I think I think it's a, a good law. Uh, especially since we talked about the uh, the parents in Michigan that were pretty lackadaisical about uh, mm. their uh, their son who was causing lots and lots of problems at school and had been routinely called in to, and been suspended for for uh, violence and threatening behavior and they just got him a gun and let him have full access to it and then he brought it to school and so that's and they're serving time for it but uh, that's. I I think overall this is this is good law. I I think it's one of those laws that I don't think it's going to affect very many people because of you know of the kids that are declared to be dangerous there probably aren't that many officially and legally being declared dangerous for this to work and then of those that the parents actually are directly and intentionally giving them access to guns is even smaller. So I think that it's, it's a law that's not going to be used much, but eh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shake my head at it. And certainly it's a good chuckle because I'm seeing lots of articles talking about this story where they're kind of ignoring all the anti-gun bills that he, that he vetoed, but talking about these and going, Oh, this is a victory for gun control. (laughs) 
And you know what? Let's let's use that let's use that dry laugh of yours, Aaron, as as a transition to more dry laughter because this was uh, this was sent to me by a friend of the show, Sid Hartha. Uh, he and uh, boy, I got a I got a, a good laugh of this, which is Spike Cohen. The uh, he was uh, best known for the is part of the uh, Libertarian Party of America is uh, is debating David Hogg at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. <sighs> uh, Brandon Laney's loss is what? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, that's... For people who don't know, um, Brandolini's Law is also known as the BS Asymmetry Principle, mm-hmm. which means that in order to debunk information, you're going to expend like 10 times the effort that the person spent in spewing it out. And most of the time, it's a losing effort. And uh, Weird Beard and I experienced this as well, because um, I'm not even sure how many years ago it was sometime during the pandemic, uh, David Hogg said something ridiculous involving, uh, you know, how the early members of America, you know, were, were in favor of, oh God, I don't even remember. It was something completely stupid involving um, the, the Underground Railroad and people of color and things like that. And I was actually asked for a statement on it by uh, i believe it was the republic and it turned into an article that you researched Mm -hmm. and i wrote and you know i i think camera hog spent maybe a minute comprising that tweet whereas i'm not sure how many minutes or hours you've spent doing research and then i crafted it uh you know it was basically an afternoon's work for me and so you and i put way more work into it than he put into it and he didn't even read it. So I, I, I wish Spike Cohen, you know, absolutely the, I, I guess it doesn't really need luck, but, um, you know, he's going to be banging his head against the wall of stupid. And, uh, I hope that he doesn't hurt himself. I mean, I think people are well aware of who David Hogg is and, uh, and, uh, his, uh, his SAT scores were leaked. So, so it's not, uh, SAT scores is not an intelligence test, but <laughs> causation <laughs> causation does, does not equal correlation, but but it sometimes does. And he he scored very very poorly and got rejected from all colleges until Harvard decided to uh, to kick out uh, Kyle Kashev and essentially give to, who was a survivor of Parkland as well and uh, give David Hogg his position because Kyle is pro gun. And, uh, and and conservative leaning, and David Hogg was exactly the type of Harvard man that they want. <sighs> so, but the uh... ah, he, here we go. It was the Federalist. Mm-hmm. It was February of 2020, and Hogg was claiming that minority and queer people started the anti-gun movement. Why don't you put that article in the in the show notes? Because we did we did. Oh, spend I'm a absolutely lot of good going to. That's that and, and, uh, that's th- that's why I look. Uh, that's why I was looking it up. <laughs> and and you you say mostly for the bad, but it's a really really good article. So David Hogg didn't read it, but I wonder if he can read. Uh, oh yeah, it was a, it was a great article. And in fact, um, well, when I say I got paid for it, what I mean is because I turned it into an article. I requested payment for it, and I requested payment on behalf of Operation Blazing Sword. So I didn't profit. Um, the the writing credit went to the charity that I administer. So my point being is, it was nice that the publisher thought it was worth paying for. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I I think Spike will do just fine. He is a very very well versed in uh, Second Amendment uh, uh, history and uh, and Second Amendment debate. Uh, and is very, very well versed in the talking points of anti gunners and the, the very, very slim repertoire that David Hogg has at his disposal. The only thing that could go poorly for Spike is, uh, is if, he, if the uh, moderator is, uh, is a little, a, a little on the soft side or is, leaning towards the side of gun control, in which case things can get a little asymmetrical. Uh, but uh but also i i posted in the uh in in the show notes um a debate between uh this what what year did this come out let's have a quick peek um 
uh, it was nine years ago, so 2014, uh, between Evan DeFilippis of, uh, well, it was Armed with Reason at the time, that blog is now defunct, and uh, uh, and Dr. John Lott, who needs no no other introduction from uh, from us, and uh, if if anybody wants to see a, a a a very 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 intelligent and very practiced uh, pro Second Amendment debater up against someone who vastly overestimates their intelligence, uh, this is a great way to look. But you will see that. Lot just had him going, had him going. But meanwhile, Evan DePhillips just was just discarding everything that he, uh, uh, that, 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 that was, that wasn't do, doing in his favor and essentially just changing the subject constantly. And, uh, he actually declared himself the winner of the debate on, on his website. And I'm like, I'm like, uh, <laughs> it was very brave of you for, po- for posting that video. He said, you really, you really did poorly. He goes, Oh, what video are you talking about? This one. <laughs> <laughs> like you got trashed like the only victory that he got which was the the fact that he did get uh dr lot to admit that more guns equals less crime was a slightly hyperbolic um uh statement in the fact that there have been some instances where um uh, where uh E- either gun control is passed or 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 gun or gun laws are relaxed and the crime rate stays relatively the same at no point in time has there ever been an instance where uh, actually there's been one time during the during the Ferguson riots of Missouri they happened to have also gotten rid of their uh, their pistol purchase permit and it happened to be at a time when Missouri was on fire for a good amount of time uh, but that is the only time in United States history or really the world history where gun gun control laws were relaxed and crime went up <sighs> all right well I'm going to move on and this, I'm going to use this as, as an intro. And of course you mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the asymmetry principle, because I'm going to use this as an intro to an audio fist that I recorded. And I will note that the asymmetry principle is very much visible because the source material that I used was under four minutes and it's a 10 minute fisk. <laughs> and that not, not including, including the research time that I had for it. But, uh, this comes from the state of Florida, Aaron. Yeah, and uh, it's the first I've heard of it because I've got other things going on. But and I'm going to let you take this. But I want to point out that this particular representative, his district, is one of it's a very very blue district. Um, Florida is run basically by three big cities. Uh, the first one is Miami, the second is Orlando, and the third is Jacksonville. And this representative, his district is most of Orlando and its environs. I mean, it it literally does cover the city of Orlando. And then there's the radius of the greater metro Orlando area, and he covers a lot of that. And so it's very urbanized. It's very touristy. And therefore, it's very, very blue. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is I'm not surprised uh, that this kind of legislation has come from him because Orlando is, it's heavily policed. All right. So this bill is called essentially the closing the zombie gun loophole because you (laughs) <laughs> just because it's a stupid stupid law doesn't mean that this isn't enough it needs to also have a stupid name uh but well he- there's also that but it's also the the tendency of gun prohibitionists to decry as a loophole uh people who are adhering to the law mm-hmm. You know, how how dare they do exactly what the law specifies? This is somehow a loophole. Yes. And so what he is declaring as a zombie gun is when uh, firearms are ordered to be destroyed, uh, that uh, uh, certain gun companies in, in the in the state of Florida are doing exactly what any of us would do if we were being charged to destroy a gun, which is they are stripping them down to the, to, to the frame, which is of course the one, the one component that is the serialized part that is legally the firearm, uh, torch cutting that, 
and 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 demilling it and marking it as destroyed. And then, oh, you've got a bin. If you were destroying a Glock, you would strip off the slide and the the fire control group and and the uh, and all the small parts and all that. Throw those into a into a bin and then torch cut the uh, the polymer receiver. The gun is officially destroyed. You can throw that away and mark it as destroyed. And then, hey, look, you've got a bunch of Glock parts to sell if you so want to. Yes, parts which do not require a background check or filling out a 4473. Uh, you can just order them online and have them shipped to your house because legally they aren't a gun. They're parts. And not only are they legally not a gun, but they also aren't a gun. <laughs> You can order as many of these parts whatsoever, and there you will not cause any problem. Even if you have the appropriate ammo, you will not cause any problem because a Glock slide and a Glock barrel and a Glock trigger uh, trigger bar will not fire fire a bullet. You need a Glock frame to go through. Uh, but of course, he's decrying it because it will, especially now in the world of 3D printers and Polymer 80 and, and all those other groups, if you have all the little bits and pieces of a Glock, you can 3D print or mill out your own Glock frame and then just assemble a gun. But you could do that anyway. And so this is, again, this is a really, really dumb law. And it's just anti-gunners angry that 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 got that pro gun people persist even after they they do they do things like order guns to be destroyed and have gun buybacks and and have gun bans and all of that and no 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 you're just supposed to stop you're supposed to just roll over and die now okay so so Aaron I said I said that was going to be a, a, a transition into my fisk but what was I meaning so hey weird what do zombies have in common with people who want to ban so called zombie knives I don't know Aaron. They both need brains. So this fisk is one of my favorite subjects, UK law. Why do I like UK law fisks so much? Because culturally, the UK and the US have a lot in common, thanks to our history of being a former English colony. But when it comes to laws, the UK has what can seem to be the deepest of deep blue US state laws turned up to bizarro. It's like Massachusetts, California, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and Maryland all combined together to make their progressive ideals and birth a small chain of islands with bad food. The scary thing about the UK laws is while pro-liberty people often decry how draconian their laws are, the totalitarians, such as the people who wish to ban guns, see the UK as the ideal role model to follow. The same people who say, we only want common sense gun laws, don't seem to be appalled at the extremism in the British Commonwealth. We know that other countries, in response to one mass shooting, have been able to craft laws that almost eliminate mass shootings. Friends of ours, allies of ours, Great Britain, Australia, countries like ours. Now, I found this clip via Colia Noir, who's taken to be quite the anti-gun fisker himself, and I've linked his video in the show notes. I'm going to try to stay off his toes and, and keep this complimentary to his commentary. So make sure to go check out the show notes and watch his video as well. This clip is shorter, but it's all too rich in talking points. In this case, on UK knife laws. Have a look at this. I'm now brandishing in front of you a 21-inch, brutal-looking black knife. It is sharp. Believe you it's me. It's terrifying. It is Terrifying. It is terrifying. If someone approached me with that, I, I would think it was the end of my days. It, it is one of yeah. the most scary things that I've ever held in my hand. Yeah. There's no two ways yeah, about it. Horrific. I bought this online for £23.49. So the knife in question is a Schrade Sawback Machete. I found a listing for it on Knife Center for $19, and it is junk. Check the reviews in Knife Center. As a machete, most of the reviewers are talking about its intended use, clearing brush and most complain about poor edge retention and the blade bending due to its poor steel quality. Colin Noir notes that both hosts claim to be scared of it, yet they're holding it and just talking. Have you ever shown a gun to somebody who's scared of guns? Hell, I've handled knives around people who are scared of knives. What do they do? They don't sit there having a conversation with you. They ask you to put it away. The fear here is all political theater. Also, if I saw somebody coming at me with that knife, 
well, if it was Oddball or Mad Mike, I wouldn't be scared, but excited to see what they wanted to show me. Or say I was helping a buddy do some yard work and maybe they went to go get me a machete. Entirely legally. And I had it sent to and this studio. All because studio. of the script or writing. It has got no writing on it. If that had writing on it that said Zombie Hunter 5000, yeah. it yeah. would be illegal. Because it doesn't, it is completely legal. Why wouldn't they be legal to buy? Of course they're talking about the new zombie knife prohibition, which doesn't take much to draw parallels to things like the federal assault weapons ban. While AR-15s were illegal assault weapons, unless you pinned the muzzle brake on the muzzle and fixed the stock and made sure the magazines were pre-94. Oh, but the high-capacity M1 carbine? Totally a sporting rifle and not a weapon of war. And the underlying point of this whole nonsense is that the zombie knife ban was passed because they couldn't pass a more wide-reaching knife ban, but because they had to make the ban trivial to get it passed, and therefore it's ineffective. So we need more ineffective bans! Of course, we saw this with the assault weapons. While the pro-gun activists were rallying for the sunset, the anti-gun activists were demanding stricter laws and the closing of so-called loopholes. And the states that passed local assault weapons bans have repeatedly revamped them, making them stricter than the federal ban ever was in both limiting features, but also eliminating the grandfather clause that allowed legally owned guns to remain legal. So you've done nothing illegal, so you can sit in that studio opposite me with that 20-inch knife, which would kill me in seconds oh, if you... Yeah, absolutely. Kill several people. In seconds. It, is, it is terrifying. This knife got mostly one-star ratings on Knife Center. Plus... How do you Brits not understand knife murder? Y'all got enough of it. You should know that A, it generally takes a lot longer than seconds to die from a machete attack. B, it's definitely not going to kill several people in seconds, even if it had a decent blade. C, most of the UK knife crime is not with zombie or otherwise scary knives. Instead, they're just using simple kitchen blades. And D, you aren't terrified. You got a silly little wall hanger knife and you're pleased with yourself. Who wants to bet that Nigel here is going to hang that blade on his office wall after this report? Oh, and E, buying garbage knives is a standard American pastime. We do it all the time, and it's neither a big deal nor something that should be a crime. But it gets worse, Nick, I'm afraid, because I've heard from several police sources, in fact, this is where the story was alerted to us, that they're turning up to raids on the properties of known violent criminals. They're finding knives just like this. But because there is no writing on the knives, the police can do nothing. One police officer described it to me, the legislation, as completely pointless. Here's the pointless thing. They frame it in scary terms. But let's frame it in innocent terms. Police are showing up at people's houses and finding chef knives and gardening tools, and they can't arrest people for it! What's worse is... If the knife was painted with goofy novelty crap, they could arrest them for it. The UK has lost their damn minds. We've also spoken to criminal lawyers who've confirmed that the loophole exists. Essentially, if you want the detail, the Offensive Weapons Act 2019 came into force in July last year. And under that, a so-called zombie knife must fit three key criteria. It must have a cutting edge. You can see there's a cutting edge on this knife. It must have a serrated edge. There's a serrated edge on this knife. But crucially, it must have, and I'm going to quote the legislation, images or words that suggest it is to be used for the purpose of violence. Hey, that scary knife you have there is a machete. It has a cutting edge because it's a blade. But it also has a serrated edge because it's a gardening tool. You hack brush with the blade, but you can also saw through limbs with the serration. Also, some geeky notes, serrated edges don't do great on things like human skin, and often you see serrated knives or combo edges for cutting through synthetic fabrics or sawing wood or metal. Also, another amusing note, you know what's neither a cutting edge nor a serrated edge? A classic stiletto. There are modern stilettos that have cutting edges, but there were certainly many that were just pointed bars of various cross-sectional types, and they were exclusively used as offensive weapons. See that above joke about the M1 carbine not cl being classified as an assault weapon in the federal ban. Now, to be completely clear, the loophole only exists in a private setting because possession of a knife like that in public is already illegal under pre-existing other legislation. But nonetheless, that remains legal.
And this is the kicker. I was kind of avoiding mentioning this directly until the very end. All this himmony and hawing has been over simple possession. This isn't a discussion about whether it should be illegal to carry a machete in public or if you should be allowed to carry a pocket knife with zombie slayer written across the blade. No, they want it to be illegal for you to have a knife in your home. So I own a bunch of stuff that would be illegal for me to carry in public here in Massachusetts. Saps, swords, daggers, brass knuckles. I got a trench knife, which is all of those things in one delightful package. But nobody cares so long as they just sit on my desk or hang on a wall as a conversation piece. It only becomes a problem legally if I'm in public with them. And let's be honest, much of the country doesn't care. Of course, it's extra absurd that I can carry a 45 caliber handgun fully legally, but not a small double-edged knife or a sap or even a collapsible baton. Weapons are weapons, and people should have the right to defend themselves with whatever tools they desire. At least there's a grain of sense saying that I can't carry a sword in the grocery store. But in the UK, a four-inch pocket knife is a criminal act, as is a fixed blade knife of any length or a locking blade. You know that safety feature that keeps the knife from closing on your hand? Yeah, that's illegal. No, they're talking about knives that are illegal to own in any circumstance, as in unregistered machine gun illegal. And of course, at no point do you hear the anti-gun politicians here who call for common sense gun laws making a statement about UK knife laws being unreasonable. You know why that is? Because they want us to be next. If they ever ban all or even most of the guns, knives are next. Never forget that. Those are your anti-gun talking points and a few rebuttals to combat them. So actually, I, I wanted to put this in the main topic, but I realized it worked so much better as a follow-up to this. And you you mentioned not wanting to to uh to publish a uh a, a uh, OBS Pink Pistols press release on April 1st and this article that I have linked in the show notes was linked on April 1st and I was like I they they have a link to the actual law that they're talking about and I like I I went and actually read the actual law cuz I'm like is this is this an April Fools joke please don't let this be a no- this would be a very cruel April Fools joke mm-hmm. but uh you know meanwhile in in England, while they are they're trying to greatly expand their already ridiculous draconian knife laws, uh, knife rights has got a uh, got a bill signed into law in Idaho, and that is called the uh, what, what is the name of it? The uh, oh the the the, the knife the the knife the knife uh, knife rights preemption bill, which basically states that outside of a very few specifically enumerated instances that no city, county, township, whatever, can pass more restrictive knife laws than the state has. And some of those um, exemptions are, for example, you know, prisons and jails, or uh, I think schools are on here. Places where you can at least understand, okay, they can pass the no knives allowed at all. But in general, um, this is basically saying, well, it's not basically, it's exactly saying it it doesn't matter uh, what you try and pass. A city, county, or other political subdivision will not enact any ordinance, rule, or tax relating to knives. You can't overregulate them. The state um maintains the monopoly on this and i think that's fantastic i i 100 percent agree and uh we must note that uh especially in this uh after a fisk where we're talking about uh uk knife laws and and furthermore like you you, you can't carry like a stick or a club <laughs> you know cricket bat uh it, it you know on this on the streets of london because that is an offensive weapon and you will get in trouble and you will potentially do prison time uh for that and uh and absolutely uh 
you know, knife, n- knife, knife, knife bans, as well as impact weapon bans and any other ban on self-defense tools is also a Second Amendment uh, issue. It's not just firearms. We focus on the firearms because because the anti-gunners focus on the firearms. But it it, it is the, the Second Amendment is much broader than that. Yeah, that's why it says arms and not guns. Correct. So for our next segment, uh, Matt from Geek Sketches and Guns asked me if I wanted to do another segment on VR. And I said yes, because I think we're on the precipice of VR and 3D printing to become mainstream. So whenever I've given, given an opportunity to, uh, to, to publish a segment on those, I absolutely say yes. Uh, and uh, in a great tie-in between VR and the Second Amendment, the gun industry is entering the chat. Hi guys, Matt with Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns here. Figured I should probably drop in and do a little bit of an update on the whole virtual reality thing. And as of this time, Apple's Vision Pro headset has come out. There were a few changes more than people are expecting, like, hey, there's additional sizes up to basically $4,000. Congratulations, the device is even more expensive if you go top of the line. What it really comes down to is for everyone who actually bought one, it really seems like the number one use case anybody comes up with is watching movies, TV, or something else specifically filmed in a way that will work with the extended reality displays of the Apple Vision Pro. So film something on the most recent iPhone, looks pretty good, stereo, 3D, whole nine yards. Supposedly that looks amazing. Controls for gaming absolutely suck because it's trying to track your hand and do connections on that. It doesn't seem to work for most people. So primarily look at that thing as a media consumption device, not so much interactive, but you can walk around the world with you. And it can work as an alternate screen for your laptop or whatever computer you have nearby. Kind of a cool idea. But really what inspired this segment was... David and Oddball ended up coming across some nice, fun things that the shooting community has decided we will get into VR for practice. Great. I love the idea of practicing and using virtual bullets so you don't have to fire real bullets. The problem is these companies are absolutely mind-bogglingly insane and have no concept of what they're even working with. So... Right now, there are two names that are pretty big in this. It is Game, G-A-I-M. They have a couple of versions. So they have a hunting version, a clay shooting version, which looks to be just the hunting version, but with different scenarios for clay shooting and bird hunting versus sport shooting and hunting. And then they have just a sport shooting for handgun. Okay, so you have a pistol thing, so you get 10 scenarios, the training handgun and the trigger for the pistol. You get the wooden rifle and their trigger plus 8 scenarios for the shotgun and similarly for the rifle. So you're getting a wood stock and you get access to the scenarios. Unfortunately, the hunting one, they want $590 for it. The clay shooting one. $550, the sport shooting trainer. So the pistol version, $490. Or if you want to be able to do it all, you get access to all the scenarios for $1,220. Unfortunately, this is the reasonable one of the two. Unfortunately, when I say reasonable, there is no rationality to this. This is a device that you have to strap a meta quest controller to. So that means you have to go out, buy the Quest headset, or as everyone previously knew it as, the Oculus Quest, or the Quest owned by Facebook. Yeah, that Facebook. They own the Quest, and they're selling the Quest. There are three different versions of the Quest that work with this device. Now, of course, the Quest is doing all the room tracking, everything else, and the controller, which is a key part and must be used in order to use the shooting setup, That comes as part of the base purchase of the Quest. So you get the Quest headset and two controllers. There are three versions of the Quest headset currently out. You have the MetaQuest 2, which is the old version, but that one is 
currently very often found on sale for $200. Amazing deal at that price. It's absolutely a steal. It is a great entry level into the market. Not sure how much longer that price is going to be there, but if you want to get into virtual reality and try that, $200, great entry price point. The screens on that are very expensive, very hard. The lenses are very hard to do. All of the complexity is in the Quest headset. Now, let's say we step up to the Quest headset to the next level. You go for the MetaQuest Pro, which is currently going for 1000 bucks. Honestly, the hardware on that's not even as good as the MetaQuest 3 that's only 500 bucks. So, really, if you're going to do it, go for the Quest 3. If you're looking for future upgradability, if you want to get in cheap to just start off, Quest 2. But again, this company wants to charge you at a minimum of $490 to $1,220 to give you a plastic interface device that works with their software, that requires a device that, unless you're going for the top of the line that was targeted at business, that has been an utter failure for Meta, that one's 1000 bucks. That's the only one that's not more expensive that this device is not more expensive than you are literally being asked to spend more for an adapter to use their software than the hardware to run it. All the complex math, all the complex tracking, all of that is done secondary to their product that costs less than their product. And that is the game system. So $490 up to $1220 for plastic and wood adapters to use the software. The other one that's even more unrational is the Ace Club. It uses, again, the Quest 2, Quest 3, and probably the Quest Pro. They don't actually list the Quest Pro, but the Quest Pro is the Quest Pro controller is basically the Quest 3 controller with a little couple of differences. But either way, this one, it may sound cheaper because it's $228 though it is actuating the trigger and side buttons on the Quest controller. Keep in mind, you have to have a Quest, but they want $228 a year to access their software and get their cheap, dinky piece of plastic to connect to it. I'm not sure what happened with the gun community where somehow we think you put a little technology in it and it's worth 10 times what any rational person would put in it. You can get 80% of the way there with other software They cost way less. Yeah, it's not 100% what you want, but the fact is none of these devices are selling you what you actually need. Sure, you can do live competitions or play multiplayer. It doesn't matter. They are overcharging beyond the pale. Don't invest in these. Seriously, you are spending way more for these adapters to use their software than the super complex hardware that makes it all work to begin with. That'd be like buying your phone and then having to buy a piece of plastic to use your phone. That's kind of really what you're doing, except the piece of plastic is 50 times the cost of your phone. No, it doesn't make sense. But that's kind of where it is, honestly. I like the industry is doing stuff with VR, finally. But I really wish they would have some sense of proportion of what they're selling. Because when you're talking a piece of plastic that actuates triggers on another device that's doing all the tracking and everything else for you, your prices aren't even in line. Now, military first responders get a discount. Who knows what that discount is? But again, it's not worth it. I'll give links to Weird Beard for the show notes, but honestly, don't buy them. Really don't. You can take a look at them and laugh, but... It's it's definitely overcharging, and they're trying to soak everybody who's an early adopter, in my opinion. Thanks for listening. So I'm not going to get into the price differential that Matt went on a diatribe about, other than I agree with him. But his statement early on about how most people are going to use this to watch movies... And okay, that's fine. That's, I think that's a perfectly good use. And for people who, like me, have really terrible vision, um, the ability to have the screen right in front of my eyes, I think is fantastic. 
However, comma, I I think we should prepare ourselves for the inevitable result of people using this to watch porn in public, because people are filthy, (laughs) and any technological advancement is going to be driven by pornography, because we saw it with VHS versus Blu-ray, we saw it, or no, um, VHS versus Betamax, we saw it with, um, I... I think we saw it with DVDs. I think we saw that that's why Blu-ray succeeded and HD DVD didn't. That That's how we got broadband. So, um, love it or hate it, porn drives a lot of technological advancements. And just prepare yourselves for, for people to be watching this on their Google Glasses or whatever in public. I mean, it's, <laughs> why do you think the net, the internet was born? <laughs> the avenue q song mm-hmm. uh yeah no you're, you're 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 probably not wrong and yeah as far as the 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 overpriced part about it yeah that's i i, I also a- agree with matt i will though say that when people start producing vastly overpriced items the competition will see an avenue of if there's enough popularity and if there's enough of a market for it, the, the competition will, will, will sneak on in with the, Oh, we can, <laughs> we can make just as good as stuff, but we're not, we're, we're not, we're not going to demand uh, such a high profit margin. So that, that will eventually go through again. I think, I think we're on the more and more people are having uh, VR headsets, um, in their, in, in their household. Of course, yeah, Google's got their, uh, their new, uh, oh, I forgot what they call it now, but, uh, uh, but the, is it Google glass or is it, was, it something well, else? Yeah. Google glass is gone. I mean, I, did I say Google? I, I meant Apple, but Apple has their new, their, their new essentially VR periphery, uh, and all that. So I, so there's just going to be more and more of, of, of these things uh, showing up. Uh, you know what they should call it? No one asked me. Um, and I'm going to have to over explain it. So you know how they had the iMac and the iPod and the iPad? They should call it the iGlasses. Ooh, yes. Because it sounds like iGlasses. <laughs> it's the Vision Pro. I like mine better. <laughs> Everyone should like yours better. If if you don't like Aaron's better, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and, and I gotta say also on the the whole idea of VR shooting, I gotta say that uh, I really really enjoyed playing shooting games on the Nintendo Wii and the Nintendo Wii U. Um, for for those who are not familiar with that system, though I I gotta imagine most people were, you know, it had like a little essentially like a TV remote control with an accessory port on it, and most fighting game uh, shooting games that I played were uh, used the uh, the the remote with what they call a nunchuck, which has just got a a, a direct a, a, a joystick and a couple of buttons on it, and essentially I would hold the uh i would hold the remote which has a trigger on the bottom of it and then cross my wrists in essentially uh, the fbi flashlight uh grip and playing shooting games like that it was like super duper duper natural and you're just yeah pointing pointing and shooting there's a little radical on the screen so so it's not exactly point shooting but uh yeah it was it was a whole lot of fun. That was a that was a great angle, and un- unfortunately, I don't play shooting games on the, on, even though I still have a Wii U. But <laughs> since the Wii U is an ancient system, all the uh, all the PvP uh, lobbies for for the games that I have for it are just completely empty. Mm, so what you're saying is that as you've gotten older, you no longer play with your Wii. <sighs> that is true, Aaron. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> On that note, don't we have another segment, Aaron? <laughs> yes, we do. Xander has titled this piece Discontent of Winter, clearly a reference to Richard III. Xander, I see your Shakespearean reference and raise you one Dumas by simply saying, Milady. Welcome to Independent Thoughts with yours truly, Xander Opal. You might be thinking that in the winter, there's nothing for farmers to do but sit around and enjoy life. That is quite far from the truth, even for crop farmers, and extremely so for animal farmers. Winter is the time for fixing things that we didn't have time to take care of during the rest of the year. 
If something moves, it breaks. There's parts and pieces that are due for replacement on all the tillage and harvesting equipment. Anything that is pushed, pulled, or otherwise moved through or on the ground gets sanded down from use. All the moving and shaking on the combine parts wears and fatigues the metal, which needs inspection and repairs there too. This is also a good time to go around the fields and trim back any tree branches or brush that's encroaching from the fence rows. Assuming, that is, the ground isn't too muddy or the snow too deep. It's a lot easier when you don't have to deal with pushing past leaves, grass, and the extra weight of sap. If a neighbor had problems getting their harvest in, a farmer might do some custom work for them. Payment might be in traded favors in part. Diesel isn't cheap after all. And, of course, um, when you're in a bind, you might not necessarily have cash on hand. Also, uh, farmers tend to be, some farmers anyway, tend to be a bit more neighborly. And you never know when you might uh, need somebody else's help. There's also hauling crops into town. Some folks deliver right out of the field. Others will hold on and sell the grain when the price feels better, or even prefer to do their own grain drying. A few farmers will also sell directly to others if the logistics are easier. Aside from revising plans for the next several years based on the past year's crops and events, plus expected demands, farmers spend a lot of time learning. Conferences, classes, certifications, and more to keep up on the latest and greatest methods and equipment. There's also new seed varieties and hybrids coming every year. Uh, Gene modification the old-fashioned way, as well as more modern and precise methods. Even if a particular farmer isn't using any of these things right away, they'll be keeping an eye out for how it goes for folks who are using these things. Lastly, a farmer has to keep up on the various rules and regulations, see what's new or changed, so they don't run afoul of an irritated officious official. (laughs) That, That last couple items applies equally to gun owners and farmers, but there's a lot of overlap in that Venn diagram. Have fun, be safe, I hope I gave you something to think about. Man, again, loving these ones, and uh, yeah, work never stops around the farm. Even though the ground is frozen and you can't plant crops, there's there's always always more work to do. And uh, I was actually very, very pleased to hear that there are classes and seminars for uh, for farmers. I I had not heard about those specifically but uh at the same time i'm not surprised at all and again this goes against that trope that occasionally rears its head which is the oh farmers don't don't really know anything they just plant the seeds in the ground and food grows one of the things that um xander didn't mention is i do believe winter is also the time when farmers go see the doctor because they're not needed to do a lot of of things right then. And uh, I do believe that there is a humorous YouTube video by uh, Dr. Glaucom Flecken <laughs> when, when he's talking about being a rural doctor. I, I'll I'll try and uh, dig it up for he's, he's, the show he notes. Actually, the, the, two, the, two, the two things in Xander's show notes are both from, from him. Oh, okay. There you go. That's that's exactly what I was thinking okay, of. Okay, yeah. I, I don't know if I've seen I've seen that one. I definitely saw the farmer pain scale uh, <laughs> on these. Like he was mending a fence and he he wasn't feeling good, so he came in. Wait, wait, wait. He stopped chores to come to the hospital. Yeah. Did he finish mending the fence? I don't know. Did he? No, he didn't. Get the crash cart. <laughs> uh. There was actually there was actually a uh, uh, a a chubby emu uh, video. Uh, Doctor Bernard, I don't know if you've ever followed him or not. Uh, I have not. He picks. Uh, he's a, uh, a a doctor of some sort, and uh, he picks various uh, a very very dramatic um, ER uh, v- cases uh, of particularly in- interesting medical merit. You know, people getting poisoned by certain things people uh you know o- overdosing themselves on, on on certain medications uh various injuries and things like that 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 usually involve a lot of like problem solving it's essentially a like like an episode of house md but 
but uh, but really just done as a, more of a, a documentary style dramatization. Uh, but he has one where a farmer actually it turned out he wasn't aware, but developed melanoma. And rather than going to see a doctor, he just cut it off himself. And uh, that is not advised. <laughs> Did he get it all? Uh, short answer, no. Oh, no. I'm trying to remember if he lived through it. I will. I will post it in the uh, in the show notes. <laughs> oh yikes! Yes, a farmer removed his own skin cancer with a, a pocket knife. This is what happened to his brain. So I I suspect he doesn't survive at the end of this. Probably not if they're talking about his brain in the past tense. Well, that's all. That's 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 his format. Uh, you know the this the you know the the a man played video games nonstop for seventy three hours. This is what happened to his organs. Is another one in the suggested column. Oh, okay. So that's that's just his. So it, that doesn't necessarily mean that the person died, but not all of them live. So this is probably. Um, I don't know. It may end up on the blooper reel. And the only reason I'm I'm bringing this up is because it was set public on Facebook. And so uh, a Facebook acquaintance by the name of Jonathan Fisher, you know, he starts off saying, 20 years ago today, my life changed quite dramatically one morning. And this is like two days ago, so it's not April Fool's. And so he was saying that, you know, he was 25 years old and he just had, you know, the most boring textbook physical he could think of. And, you know, he's left the exam room they're walking down the hallway he and his doctor and he goes out to shake the doctor's hand uh to say thank you and then he saw something that uh reminded him that oh he'd forgotten to ask and he's going oh doctor yeah the the mole in my right hand right at the top it's nothing right and uh so the doctor you know gets his reading glasses and and takes a look at it and Mr. Fisher's there saying, uh, it's been there a couple of months. Is it a freckle? And the doctor replies with, nurse, please prep room one for surgery. And uh, he had it biopsied because the doctor believed it was melanoma. And um, the next few days, yeah, it it doesn't say. But basically, um, the the doctor's office called in the middle of the workday and uh, said, you know, the, your biopsy results are back and the doctor wants to talk with you. Oh, and and he worst. says, sure. How about maybe Thursday? We need to see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's never good. So um, the short version, he I, I realize this is already running pretty long, but yeah, it, it was malignant melanoma. Um Fortunately, they caught it at a pretty early stage, and he had, you know, more surgery and follow-ups and things like that. And uh, so, you know, he has been cancer-free for quite a while now. Um, Like I said, it's been 20 years since that first operation. I don't know how long it it was since he ended treatment. I'm pretty sure he's okay. But the point of all this is that dangerous melanoma can just look like a freckle or a mole Mm -hmm. and uh it's it's very easy to think it's nothing and then the doctors go oh no 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 so yeah don't mess around with that no i agree and 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 like i said uh i've said before the uh it's especially if you are if you are of the caucasian persuasion if you have pale skin uh, and especially if you have pale skin and you enjoy spending time out of doors, you should, uh, and especially if you're older, uh, you should acquaint yourself with a dermatologist and get checked out regularly because, uh, for, for those of us that are o- outside and, uh, and have, uh, light, co- light colored skin, uh, the possibility of you getting melanoma is pretty much near a hundred percent on a long enough timeline. And so uh, I have, I I haven't, haven't gotten anything yet though. I do have some very, very frightening looking moles on my chest, which were actually what first got me to come in just for just, just have a look at it. And my doctor went, no, you're right. They do look like they would be They're They're very irregular. They've got, uh, they, they've got uh, um, very blotchy borders, but she's like, but you've got like tons of them on you. They're all, um, 
So that means that that's just how your, 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 mel- your melanocytes work. Uh, so thankfully I, I, I don't have anything, but my dad's had a bunch of stuff removed just because he is an old man and he spent, spent his whole life out in the sun. So I am including in the show notes a link to the American Academy of Dermatology where they talk about the ABCDEs of melanoma. And it's just, I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but A stands for asymmetry, B is for border, C is for color, D is for diameter, E is for evolving. And so if you spot a discoloration, bump, or whatever on your skin, uh, and you think it's unusual, then look at these rules. And if it follows any of them, um, then you should probably, you know, check with your primary care physician. A hundred percent. And yeah, the, you, you mentioned possibly it might be in the blooper reel, but I, I think this is way too an important a topic to, 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 to have that. So that's, oh, that fantastic. is, that, this is, this is, this is all, this is all good regular show things. So yes, we advise everybody to go out there and uh get some st- get their stuff checked out uh, if if you can because uh yeah it could save your life and uh not only we're we going to advise that but we're also going to give thanks to each and every one of our listeners but a very special thanks to all of our supporters on Patreon uh to become a Patreon patron go to patreon.com slash assorted calibers podcast to sign up Patrons get an early release of the podcast, plus bonus content like the hilarious blooper reels, the ACB film tracks, and the ACP mag dump. Also, please remember to rate us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe to us on the platform of your choice, and share the show with your friends, both online and off. You can get more from me at my blog, which is weirdworlds.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. And hear me weekly on Hengun Radio on the Firearms Radio Network. And you can get more from me at Linktree slash Aaron Paulette. That's linkter.e forward slash Aaron Paulette, all one word. I didn't hear an E from you, goddammit. Uh, it's, it's, it's in there, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> and thanks to Nate Spencer for our music. Well, he doesn't play with his Wii anymore, but every day I play games with my box. Our recreation is assorted, and so is our podcast. I'm talking about electronics. Good night, everybody. <laughs>